Now I'm out here on this gorgeous beach, lots of sand, but I want to ask you a question. Have you ever had a grain of sand or some dirt in your eye? Man, it just is such an irritant, it drives you crazy. But what about if you have a needle put in your eye? Today's program may not be for the faint of heart, but it is a great program. Stay tuned. little island here. I mean, it's kind of amazing because they're all just coral. Coral of every kind, shape, but the whole island's made out of that. You know, it takes a very special people to live on places like this because very little rainwater, a lot of ways it can be dangerous. Where are you gonna go? There is no place to go except by boat. There's very little food, very little anything. Now, if you just wanna come for a weekend, maybe you can even rent a little place like this your own and a little getaway be kind of nice, but for the people here, it's a hard life. That's why Canvasback comes, is to help these people because it is such a hard life. They, they can really utilize outside help. Matter of fact, our, our doctors that come, the free surgeries that are given, thousands and thousands of dollars worth of surgeries, absolutely free thanks to Canvasback. So, you know, if you'd like to participate and be a partner in Canvasback, we'd invite you to do that because every dollar you spend is a mission dollar well spent. It's stretched to the max to help these dear people. Thank you so much. So this is the very last part of Nam Madol. Yes, it's the last part. How many years were they constructing all of this? Uh, about 500 years. And when did it start? 1100 to 1600. Long time. Yeah. Why did they quit? No. What, what they happened? were defeated by uh, some foreigners. They say they came from east, came and defeated them. All the first harvest, before you eat your first harvest of banana, you have to bring it to them. First harvest of yam, you bring it to them. Everything. If you caught a big fish, you have to bring it to them. Really? Yeah. So. Now that doesn't that doesn't make for a happy. No, everyone was really feeling bad about that. Check out this amazing wall. Here we are at Nan Madal. Some of those walls are 50 feet high. Some of the stones are 50 tons. 50 tons. Look at how intricate everything is placed. Humans came in and built all of this. I think about the human eye. Here we are with the, uh, the team, the eye doctors doing this most intricate surgery on the human eye. Yet, many people say, oh, that just happened. The human eye just happened. But could we say this just happened? You know, the, the ocean waves washed over here and all of a sudden all these rocks appeared. How many of you would believe that? Nobody would believe that. You know, some of these rocks, as I said earlier, are 50 tons or more. How did they get these here? These came all the way from the other side of the island. Nothing was here. Everything was moved to this side of the island. How did that happen? Well, nobody seems to know. The same as they don't know how the pyramids were built, the same as they don't know how the, the larger stones of Machu Picchu were placed there. the intricate design of fitting everything in. How did it happen? Well, today, especially when I went to school, you know, we're, we're taught that just evolution, the more time you add, the more years you add on to something, just everything can happen. And uh, we're taught that humanity is growing in intelligence, uh, evolution, we're evolving into a greater species. However, there seems to be a problem because scientists today, with all of their knowledge, have no idea how a lot of this happened. But let me throw something out at you here. There's a fellow that uh, wrote a book many years ago, Secrets of the Lost Races. In there, he coined the phrase, Upars, out of place artifacts. Out of place artifacts. A young man in England in the 1800s was shoveling coal into the furnace, out fell a big piece of coal, and inside was a beautifully hand-tooled 
silver necklace. How did that happen inside the coal? We're taught that Earth is millions and millions of years old. And the list goes on and on. I would submit to you that according to the Bible story, creation from the hand of the Creator, we came with extreme intelligence from the Creator. But after the fall, we've gotten less and less and less intelligent. Hence today, we can't figure out how a lot of this was done. Check out the Bible. Check out God. If you don't know God, give Him a try. At least read the Bible. Decide for yourself after you study it, after you've found out what God's really all about. You know, I look at all these massive stones, I can't help but think of the name of Pompeii. The actual meaning of it is stone altar. Sacrificial altar, stone altar. Were there sacrifices here? Well, we really don't know, but my guess is probably. See, most, most religions that believe in some other god, little g-god, tend to have sacrifices. But these people came, whoever they were, they came here, they took over the whole island, they, they quelled every other rebellion, every other war, and controlled everything. Now, it's been estimated that it may have taken a thousand people a day to construct this island for 300 years. 300 years. Where did all that food come from? Because it's been estimated again that about 40,000 people is what it would have been in this area. 40,000 people. You eat all the food in a matter of a few months. And then what happens? Today, a ship doesn't show up. In a month, people don't eat. How did all this happen? Well, we really don't know, do we? It is definitely hot in here, but where is in here? I'm actually in a burial chamber, the burial chamber of the, the big chief of Nan Madal. There are still chiefs on the island today. Things are quite different, although if you die, you have to go to the chief and get permission to, for the family to bury that person, and the actual ceremony can take 10 days. Burial is a thing that, well, matter of fact, as we grow older, you know, we, we are born and we're going to die. That's just one of the things that happened. That wasn't the way it was always meant to be. You see, Jesus promised us eternal life. We were created not for time, but we were created for eternity. And uh, that's what's exciting. We don't have to have this life be it. We've got eternity. The island, Pompeii, it's absolutely beautiful. The people are wonderful. There's a lot more story to come, so stay tuned. Canvasback Missions has been changing hearts and lives in the islands of Micronesia for nearly four decades. Founders Jamie and Jackie Spence once ferried medical and dental teams by catamaran and ship across the Pacific Ocean. But when small hospitals were established on many island nations, the mode of operation changed, as did the needs of the people. To this day, however, these hospitals lack medical specialists to perform the most difficult surgeries. On an ongoing basis, Canvasback flies all volunteer super teams to the islands to conduct surgeries and to train local medical staff. Teams are usually comprised of specialists in the fields of gynecology, orthopedics, ophthalmology, ENT, dental, and others as needed. They dedicate two weeks of life-changing mission work to relieve the pain and suffering of the people. If you would like to volunteer for two weeks of life-changing work, log on to canvasback.org and follow the prompts to volunteer. This is definitely a different look for me. Got on my surgery outfit. We're here in the surgery center in the hospital. In just a moment, we're going to have a nurse anesthetist come in. Her name's Sheila. Sheila's going to have a patient laying right here, going to inject a needle into his eye. I know that sounds like, whoa, but you get to be a part of that in a moment. Then we're going to follow him into another surgery area where he's going to have cataract surgery. Follow this, it's going to be interesting. And your head here. Kids agent will be in touch with their chief. <laughs> Can you lay down now? Perfect. 
I'm going to put a few more drops in your eye. I'm going to put some ointment in your lower lid, John. Mm -hmm. Sheila, can you walk us through what you're doing here? Yes, okay, so for the first, the first drop is a numbing drop because the numbing ointment stings. So first we put the numbing drop in for the numbing ointment. We put the numbing ointment in because the injection stings. So it's kind of a stage progressive, drop. exactly, numbing. Now see, you've got an X on his forehead so everybody knows what so eye. So we know exactly which <laughs> eye, that's right. We put an X on the forehead. We ask the patient first to confirm. We check the consent form against what the patient states. We place this X and then we put a name tag on that side and Same all side. those things help us to be 100% confident that we're working on the correct eye. And Sheila, I guess for the audience, what is your expertise? I am a nurse anesthetist and I have been working in ophthalmology. I've been a nurse anesthetist for, well, over 25 years and I've been in ophthalmology since prior to going to anesthesia school. So for about 35 years, I've been involved in eyes. Okay. Most, I, most people would think anesthesiology is as complete, uh, <laughs> completely out, but you've got a whole different field, really a very specialized field, it seems. I do all types of anesthesia. I just mm -hmm. happen to kind of get into this niche serendipitously by covering for a, a colleague 25 years ago. He wanted to go off, he bought a sailboat and he was going to sail the world and he asked if I would be interested in doing this and, and I said, sure, how hard can it be? And I soon learned. <laughs> <laughs> you soon learned how hard it is. Huh? John, do you see the photo on the ceiling, the postcard? Yeah, the black guy's what? Yes. Martha, would you be so kind as to pump the bed up, please? So now, there are eight muscles around the eye that all converge in the back into the muscle cone. The target of this injection is the muscle cone so that we make the muscles numb, the eye can't move, and we make the eye numb so it doesn't feel anything, the optic nerve. John, you're going to feel me touch the lower lid of your right eye with my finger. So I know how long John's eye is from the front to the back based on a measurement that was taken in the clinic called the axial length. That axial length helps me know how to place the needle. We should probably t tell some of the viewers if you're squeamish, don't watch this. <laughs> don't try it at home. Don't try it at home, yeah, true. <laughs> John, I know you're in very good hands with this lady, though. Mm. So I retract the lower lid. I place the needle perpendicular to the plane of the face. Around the eyeball is what's called a periorbital fat pad. No matter how thin you are, we all have fat on our eye. I just let the needle float through that. And now I begin to angle back towards the muscle cone and the optic nerve. We can see how his lid is starting to go down a bit already. That tells me I'm exactly where I need to be. And you've done this how many times? Over 30,000. I started when I was 12. Please don't think I'm old. <laughs> John, if this is uncomfortable, please tell me. I'll stop. Am I hurting you? Metek? No? OK. When I come on a mission trip, I like to learn a few basic phrases in the native language in the event that people are not available to translate. I can say basic commands, such as open your eyes, are you having pain? And of course, I don't speak Pompeian. That's an important phrase in case they begin to speak back. So you can see how the lid is drifting down now. Mm -hmm. That tells me I'm in a very good spot. Are you OK? Mm -hmm. All right. I'm going to put a few more drops in your eye now and give you a little eye massage. This might sting a bit, Mr. John, I'm sorry. Are you okay? Yeah. I think they got your best side. I think you're a very good patient. Yes. You're doing very good. 
So could you read the eye chart at all? Or did you just see somebody waving their hand? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just waving the hand. <laughs> so we measure from 2020, 2400 is that big E. Then the next thing we start are, can you count fingers? Mm -hmm. And then after that, if they can't see that, can you see my hand moving? Okay. How many patients do you get in here that that's pretty much it? Just in the... um, I would say probably better than half because they don't, you know, they they don't have access to immediate care. So a lot of them will let their cataracts go and go and go. Um, by the time we see them, many of them have just this white, hard lens in their eye that they can't even see light through. Tell me, I understand here in the equator that uh, you can actually, more people get cataracts because, because of the of sun the exposure? Sun. Exactly. And, and nobody and, wears sunglasses. And they don't sunglasses. wear sunglasses, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. okay. Mr. John, you can open this eye. Okay. All right. I'm going to help you sit up now. Mm -hmm. Can you sit up? Good. And just bring your legs around. There you go. And just sit for a moment now. Diabetes is also a huge factor on the island here that causes cataracts on people. Okay, Mr. John, there's a step. Take your time standing up and step down. There's a step. Step down. Perfect. And we're going to go back now and wait for surgery. In a few minutes, you'll go in the operating room. Oh, yeah? Okay, yes. You're all ready, huh? I don't know. Uh, surgery is already done. <laughs> no. Mr. John, we're good, but we're not that good. <laughs> you thought it was all over, huh? <laughs> yeah, I'll hang on to you here. We'll see you in the surgery room. Okay. We're going to go around the corner to the right here. We've got a lot more exciting things for you, so stay tuned. Kazumi was about seven years old when she experienced ear infections in both ears. Her mother took her to the doctors, but they couldn't seem to clear up the infections. A couple of years passed and she began to lose some hearing. Her family saved up all the money they could and took her to another country looking for help. But all of the doctor's attempts failed. Two more years passed and Kazumi had lost most of her hearing. Her classmates tried to compensate by talking louder or standing in front of her directly so she could read their lips. Then a canvasback ENT super team arrived and did surgery on both ears. Kazumi's hearing was restored. For almost four decades, canvasback has been changing hearts and lives one miracle at a time. But your financial help is needed to keep this important work going. If you would like to volunteer or be a financial partner, log on to canvasback.org. Mr. John, we're going to check your block. Can you open your eye? Mm -hmm. Of course not. Now follow my finger. Look over here. Look over here. See how his eye has no mobility? What? Yeah. So we're just. Mr. John, you look like a salmon I whacked when I was dip netting last week. You okay? All right, let's go to the operating room. All right, uh, John, I like to pray before surgery. Is that okay? Good. Okay, let's say a prayer. Dear Jesus, we want to ask for your presence and your blessing on this surgery. We recognize you as the great physician and healer and ask that you'll guide during this procedure. Pray for quick healing afterwards and good vision, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So I don't want to disturb you, but can you walk us through a little what you're doing now? Sure, so the, like I said, this calcium deposition is kind of in a line that goes across the eye, kind of horizontally. Uh, and unfortunately, it's right in the center of his vision. Um, so what I'm doing now is I'm just kind of drying the surface, and then, uh, and then I'm gonna take an instrument to kind of start to gently kind of, um, remove that deposition on the surface here. She's gonna hand me an instrument. Take the crescent. What's the actual cause of, uh, how, how does that 
come about? Um, you know, it. that's a really good question. There's a lot of causes. Um, it can be um, sometimes people can have systemic causes. Um, you know, if they, they have uh, problems with their kidneys um, and they have high calcium, that can cause the calcium to deposit on their eye. Or if they've had um, chronic long-term surface disease in the eye, you can get some calcium deposition. Um, okay, I'll take that, uh, take the fine tip burr. So like I was saying, the, the uh, calcium gets kind of deposited within the tissue a little bit. So okay. I'm moving trying to remove just a little, as little as tissue as possible and get all the calcium out of there. Everything's going good. John, are you doing okay? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Gonna hear kind of a buzzing sound, a little, uh, little vibrating sound. Don't let it startle you. I'll have your ear eating on there. Yeah, uh, not necessarily. Yeah, that's good. I'll, I'll let you know. How long can the human eye stand being open without uh, any kind of irrigation? That's a really good question, you know. Um, not 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 too long that's why you'll see us kind of put fluid on there uh, on a pretty regular basis we don't want to go too long without keeping the eye the cornea especially the front windshield is really important to keep it from getting too dry sheila is very typical of our volunteers she's dedicated compassionate and committed she's a professional and applies her skills with precision John is like so many of our island patients, searching for hope where there has been so little. Kind, gentle, and very gracious. Canvasback is the vehicle that has been bringing hope and healing for almost four decades to people in need. Everything we do is made possible through the financial gifts of viewers like you. And please do keep Canvasback missions and all the people we are healing in your prayers. To be a part of this exciting ministry, write us at Canvasback Missions, 940 Adams Street, Suite R, Venetia, California, 94510. You can also log on to canvasback.org or call us at 707-746-7828. Oh, thank you for watching. Please join me again for another exciting island adventure. Remember, Canvasback is making an impact on hearts and lives one miracle at a time.